Hello, everyone. Today we will be continuing reading Johnny Torres's book. But as always, we will first start with the Statement of Unity, which I will pull up right now. All righty. Can everyone see this? Yes. Right on. All right. I'll begin reading the Statement of Unity preface. Mm. The U.S. was founded as a, as a colonial southern state based upon white supremacy and slavery, stealing the lands of the indigenous nations, breaking every treaty made with them, and confining them to quote-unquote reservations, concentration camps. As the country became more powerful, the ego sunk its claws into other nations, making one Mexico and grabbing its northern territory, evading Cuba, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and the Philippines, and either annexing them outright or making them colonies or neo-colonies. And, in the 20th century, it became the major imperialist power in the world, exploiting both the people within its boundaries and those in every other country, bullying them with military interventions, and robbing them of their right to self-determination. As Hugh P. Nguyen stated, quote, We have two enemies to fight, racism and capitalism. Between the two, capitalism is primary. Racism is a byproduct of capitalism. The working people of the world, of every ethnicity or nationality, face a common face a common enemy that is destroying life on Earth. Our enemy is a small ruling class of property owners controlling most of the world's wealth and resources. We must have our basic needs met to live a good and meaningful life. Food, shelter, health care, education, freedom from the oppression by the state, and peace with other nations. To obtain these essential things for life, we must have the power to see to it that the abundance that's available is shared equitably. Statement of Unity for the Second Rainbow Coalition. The legacy of the First Rainbow Coalition dates back to its founding on April 4th, 1969, by the original Black Panther Party, original Young Lords, and Young Patriots Organization. A number of other organizations joined this coalition not too long afterwards, such as the American Indian Movement, Brown Braves, Rising Up Angry, the Red Guards, and others. Since the founding of the United States, the mass had developed a number of popular movements that came together to fight back to, to fight back against this capitalist imperialist system in various ways or on particular demands. Nevertheless, none had established a movement quite like the First Rainbow Coalition. This historic movement was the first of its kind that established a model of class struggle like no other. Its charismatic leader, Chairman Fred Hampton of the Illinois, of the Illinois chapter of the original Black Panther Party, stated at the end of the day, we weren't engaged in a quote-unquote race struggle. He said that's a class struggle, goddammit. By uniting with the various oppressed with the various oppressed ethnicities and masses, they were able to bridge the gap between the various ethnic communities that white supremacy had long sought to keep divided. This class solidarity equipped them with the material basis and class consciousness to see their common class condition. Therefore, the necessity to form a united front against their common class oppressor the capitalist and peerless ruling class. The ruling class viewed this as the greatest threat to their class rule, and subsequently used the entire repressive forces of the state, police, courts, jails, prisons, intelligence agencies, etc., in order to crush this emerging revolutionary socialist movement. We refounded the Rainbow Coalition on May 14, 2021, with the intent of upholding the legacy of the, of the original Rainbow Coalition. We believe that this historic example is the model. Uh, we believe that this historic example is the model for the United Front that will best serve our class liberation. By upholding the template program of the original Black Panther Party, which was which was subsequently adopted and later expanded by the original Black by the original Young Lords, Young Pages organization, and all and all other original Rainbow Coalition members, we established our pragmatic unity. The six disciplinary rules that we uphold ties all organizations in our coalition to a common professional discipline. History has bestowed upon our generation a common class mission to fulfill. The representatives of the capitalist and peerless ruling class, represented by the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, cannot liberate us. It is their class intention and class interest to uphold our common class oppression. Therefore, it is only we, the oppressed masses of all ethnicities and nationalities, who must build the necessary class solidarity, class consciousness, organizational structures, and a united front that will ultimately liberate ourselves. This is what the Second Rainbow Coalition is committed to. This is the historic mission we intend 
to fulfill. Dare to struggle, dare to win. All members of the coalition, New African Black Panther Party, White Panther Party, Green Party of New Jersey, Poor People's Army, La Mesa Nacional de Brand Berets, NASA, North Alabama School for Organizer, Organizers, New Era Young Lords, and the American Indian Movement Northeast Woodland Chapter. The six disciplinary rules. Number one, members will conduct themselves in a manner to bring credit to the coalition and will treat others with respect and politeness. Number two, members will be sober when on Rainbow Coalition business and will not engage in any criminal activity while a member. Number three, no member will engage in violence except in the extremity of self-defense. Number four, members will be sober when on Rainbow, I'm sorry, members will not gossip nor be divisive to the unity of the Second Rainbow Coalition. Number five, members will not act as informers to work against the purpose of the Second Rainbow Coalition. And six, nobody is authorized to speak to is authorized to speak for the Second Rainbow Coalition unless authorized to do so. And that is the statement of beauty. And with that, uh, sisters, then you can begin um, screen sharing the book. Hello? Can anyone hear me? Oh, they left. <laughs> oh, like... they left? Yeah, for a quick bit. Excuse me, Nathay. Um, I had yeah. to run to the bathroom. <laughs> I'm back, but if, if you want to Hello? screenshot the, or screen share the uh, book, you can, Shanti. Or I can, don't matter, I'm back. I mean, you right can. On. You can. Okay. Um. Yeah. Okay. Can everybody see that? All right. Yep. Okay. okay. Wait, uh, Yesenia, la Chicana. Um, yeah, was... there was an error in the schedule. Um, well, rather an, an error in the printing of the book, the last story accidentally got copied twice. So the last one that we read on Friday was scheduled to be the first one for today, but it was a duplicate. Mm. So um, that's why gotcha. I think it was 87 instead of, I think it was 82. Uh, Makes sense. So, um, would anyone want to start reading? I can no, start. Read it. I can start okay. unless uh, unless somebody else would like to. Uh, well, let me let me have at it then. Right so, bio the origin story: Yesenia La Chicana. I was raised by my grandparents in Segundo Barrio, Houston, Texas. My grandfather was a trailero, a trucker. So we spent most of his, this, his time off on road trips to Mexico. A lot of the areas we traveled were what I learned over time, poverty areas. I never knew that when I was a kid, it was always so much fun. The people were so nice and humble. Everything was, on, of, was of the earth and la gente de los cierros, the people of the mountains. Can we get it to grow scrolled up? As my abuelita, my grandmother, would, I need it to be scrolled up. Mm 
I'm I'm having audio trouble here. Um, Comrade Joe, Comrade Joe said to scroll it up. Okay. Nice. Okay, as my abuelita would call them, made stuff to sell for income. A lot of those people spoke in a different dialect, didn't understand them, but I knew what they were saying. From the moment we arrived until the moment we left, there was always a great aura amongst us all. When we'd come back home, it was a different world here. My abuelita watched the news daily because there was a TV in the sala. Only I watched the news daily as well. You didn't see la gente de los cerros here. All we heard of was crime, police brutality, of our road trips. I remember seeing and hearing stories about los zapatistas and how those guerrilleros would wear masks and carry weapons to protect their people from government officials. There were women in combat outfits, men of all ages, elderly people, even children. I thought that was so scary. My abuelita would tell me, don't worry, they are so far away. That won't ever happen here. In time, of course, it came to pass that it does happen here. There is so much injustice in the criminal system, injustice on the part of the government officials, falsely accused American-born citizens who are not able to exercise their right to the fullest in order to get in order to defend themselves. Trigger-happy police officers getting away with murder, even when caught on live recordings. Children ripped from their parents' arms and so many missing children who have yet to be accounted for. Even now, years later, after being reported as disappeared by American officials at the border, I am writing this today because I was asked, what made you become a Brown Beret or Brown Beret supporter? Or a brown beret supporter having the ability to speak freely and loudly regarding injustices for those people who cannot that is what sparked my interest finding a group of people who wholeheartedly go out and speak out or protest for those who fear legal retaliation on e or even deportation if they stand up for themselves so many people aren't even aware that they have a voice. They don't know about their legal rights. In the year 2010, I was brutally beaten up by police officers for asking a simple question. Why are you pushing her? It was a suspected DUI stop. While doing the field sobriety test, the officer kept shoving my driver, almost as if intentionally making her fail the test. She didn't because she was not intoxicated. The officer did not like that, and I had questioned him. He immediately rushed me and tripped me to the floor and told me, I told you to stop questioning me. Now shut the fuck up. I was on the ground, of course. I'm upset. I yell at him that he didn't have to do that. He could have just stopped shoving my friend. So I was arrested but not before being kicked on the floor multiple times by about six police officers. I was only charged with interfering with a police officer on duty and the court ordered anger management classes. This being 2010, my boss wanted to hire a lawyer and sue the city. Camera phones were not a thing yet. My boss had his lawyer on the phone and I told him to hang up. Why? Because in my mind, we could never beat the police. In my mind, they didn't kill me. All I had was bruising and would most likely lose the case anyway. And then I would be on the one of their lists to be messed with intentionally all the time. I was afraid of the police, especially those officers that had continuously kicked me. A woman in swimming attire. They beat me with clubs and kicked me while I lay on the gas station parking lot. I should have held them accountable for emotional distress at the very minimum. I was riding the bus one time and panicked when I saw an officer because I didn't have a seatbelt on. Buses don't have seatbelts. I should never be afraid of, the, of them. We are brown and they 
have higher power. That's what we are taught. Be quiet, be scared, and just let it go. This is not what I want to teach my children. We have rights. We have a voice. And there are people out there like the Brown Berets who can stand up with us and for us. A, I watch, and let me see. As I watched the news unfold in 2017, about the 17,000 or so heard a congressman, congresswoman say, we don't know where they are. Who was wa watching them? Who was, what, yeah, we don't know their ages and names. We don't know. And when are we going to find out the names? Or find out where and what happened to them. We don't know. How can you not? Meeting adjourned. We have no further information and walked away from the podium. When I saw that announcement, I cried. Families were looking for their children that had been taken from their parents at detention centers in the southern border. They were given the runaround for weeks. Officials stated that there were no just there were just too many children to have one facility. So they shipped them off to different states. What the actual fuck? This story had my full attention. The headline swiftly went from where are the children or donde están los niños to reunite families at the border or stop separating families at the border. I'm like, okay, great news. I agree. Stop separating families. But where are the missing children? I had already met the Brown Berets before and I was at already interested in helping the community. This gave me the full courage to stand up. All I can think about was La Gente de los Cerros, how the parents must feel in a strange place, mourning the kidnapping of their children, surrounded by mean strangers who don't even understand what I'm saying. La Gente de los Cerros came to mind because of their humbled souls, happy faces, and such fragile bodies, seeing them being shattered at a envision how, as I envision how our ancestors must feel, seeing their people treated horribly on their own land, stolen land, they are literally migrating to a better place for a better life. They are the reason I speak up and what I love to stand up for our people. Police brutality, being at the top of my list, others being discrimination, failed school systems, and racial profiling. My list is very long, lacking greatly. And that can help others. I strive to absorb the knowledge that leaks from the people I've met marching alongside of my Brown Beret comrades. I consider myself a Brown Beret. Supporters, because... Supporter, Brown Beret supporter, because I am not as active in the community as would love to be. While I wear my Brown Beret, I feel I have a louder voice. I feel my ancestors win. The power of the sun is with us when we march. It is with great pride that I stand with my Brown Beret brothers and sisters. Because had they not had the, the courage to stand up and fight for our gente as others have in the past, I may not have found the courage to do so. United as one is how we get things done. In a country where hate and division are all we see, we are to be an example to our children so that they, as well as our great-grandchildren, may follow our lead and continue fighting for La Causa. Stand proud, stand tall, stand together for La Causa, for our gente, for our future. That is why I became a Brown Beret. Yesenia Hernandez, also known as Yesenia La Chicana. Beautiful. Fucking A. Ow. That was beautiful. And I, but I guess that's, I think I've seen her too in, in Houston. Not gonna lie. Uh, like a lie when I when when it said Yesenia, I thought it was like about the Yesenia that we know, the one that, that, that that's in this um this um in Colorado this yeah yeah 
Yeah, well, yes, maybe uh, we can get a little feedback from Yesenia, being that they share the same name, um, and I guess we all share pretty much the same struggle. Um, yeah. Did you have anything you wanted to put it sharing with that sister? Um, maybe not right now. Right? Hello. Hello. Hello, Carmen hey. Yesenia. Hello. Yes, it's um, inspirational and and it's powerful. Just hearing why people joined the movement, why they became activists, what what triggered them, what pushed them to the point where they had to stand up and speak out um, and bring attention to all these issues. Um, and especially when it comes to the kids, to the children. Um, but it's nothing new. It just changes. I guess it just changes the way it looks over the centuries. Yeah. But kids have been taken from their homes, from their families since colonization began to try to kill the Indian and save the man to educate, to convert, to have a labor force in California for people to build the missions. They didn't have anywhere else to go because they were getting killed and slaughtered in the mass genocide. So they became slaves and servants, they want. you know, um, and I don't know if it, we've gotten so desensitized to violence or um, we've just been exposed to it so much or heard it so much, um, like on the news and whatnot with school shootings, um, the kids in the detention camps, things like that, that it's like, oh, it's another story. Oh, that's another missing kid. Um, and it's hard to see that in, in our families and in our communities because we don't talk about it, we don't discuss it, and we don't move forward in trying to resolve the issue just because we get we have so many issues that are piling on, on one on top of the other. So we get our energies get divided. Where do we go? Who do we try to find first? Missing mm -hmm. murdered indigenous women, Palestine, kids at the border, um, people getting separated from families all because of legal status. It's just, it's overwhelming and it's sickening just to see how on one side people are all about, oh yes, every life matters, um, save the babies, like no abortions, um, all of that stuff. And then on the other hand, all of these atrocities are happening. And that's not even talking about the child trafficking and sex trafficking. Yeah. And I think that it's that it's that alienation part in the within the people that exacerbate, you know, these problems, you know, because this has been going on for five hundred and thirty one years now, since, you know, this is the month, you know, to the day, you know, five hundred and thirty one years ago. So, you know, it's it's that kind of, you know, it's just another missing kid, you know, just another school shooting, just another, you know, death in the community. And when we don't have those systems, we just get used to it and we don't know where to go. And we feel that there's no real place for us, that there's no way out. And we just bury ourselves with work, work, work to not confront it. And that's, that's a problem that we need to really, really address is that 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 alienation from struggle is essentially what it is. They are so alienated from revolutionary struggle and agitating and organizing each other and educating each other that it, it, they they just collapsed under it, you know, psychologically, mentally, spiritually. And, you know, these are things that affect not only Chicanos because they are Native people, but especially Africans as well, since, you know, we were kidnapped from our homeland. And so, you know, it's 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 those layers that really like need to be unlocked because, you know, if we just keep ignoring the root cause of the problem, which is capitalism, which is colonialist, uh, capitalist imperialism, then we will continue to genocide ourselves and be genocided to an early grave. And, you know, the alienation 
you know, from struggle is one of those things that we really need to really like confront head on because if we think that we're just going to ignore the problem and, you know, hide and run and thinking that, you know, that, you know, we can just, you know, pray for a miracle, then you're, you're just mistaken because once again, it's just, it's just going to be more problems and more problems until it just explodes and, you know, there's nothing to do to contain it. Good, good, both good points from Yesenia and uh, the uh, comrade uh, Shanti. Uh, More percent. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Right on. We got to continue, uh, we gotta continue the, the struggle for the youth and make them realize that things don't have to be this way. For the kids. For the kids. Because we're the most oppressed. So we oh, definitely yeah, Santa. Put the children in the forefront because well, we're, in the, we're in the brunt of this, all yeah. of it. All of that. And uh, that sign right there says, uh, for those that don't read Spanish. Ser uh, inmigrante no ser, es ser animal. Donde están los niños? Andale. <laughs> right on. Cool. And Which, that, I think that's a question that still needs to be answered because there's still a lot of kids that are in these detention centers. They're missing. I know we were going real I'm, strong about it a year or two ago, and it's kind of like not even really being mentioned anymore. And that's something we definitely need to keep into attention. Yeah. And that's all. Right on. Because there are so missing kids that are just not found. Those those fucking cages and those fucking and those yeah. fucking concentration camps at the fucking border because that's what they are. The concentration camps. Some of those kids are never found. They just go and just people just they, they just don't care and it's fucked up. And, and they move on. Yep. Like, like that's what I fucking have about these performative shit uh, about about performative and opportunistic people who claim to actually care. They care until it's no longer quote unquote trendy. Then they right. just move on and, and don't care anymore. And that needs to change. That needs to now. change. We don't need we don't need accomplices. We don't need allies. We need revolutionaries. We need comrades. That's what we need. Also, um, if it's okay with with everyone, I'd like to read this part right here. All righty, have at it. Bye. Bio, bio, <laughs> Peggy Ramirez, Brown Bray. Mm. I chose to become Brown Bray because I am the. Chimali, I believe, I believe that's yeah. how I pronounce it. I, I am the Chimali of the people, the chi, the shield of the people. I had always wanted to be a brown gray, which I began learning about them back in 1992. I was secretary of M M E S H A, Mecha, um, while I attended Fresno State. Even then, I attended rallies and worked with Mecha or Mecca. I can't explain how I can't um, I can't explain how nor when it ha when it became that I've always believed it's important to protect our people. I grew up a vulnerable, unprotected child. I know what I know what it's like being unprotected and abused. I had no voice then, but now I have a voice to protect the people. I remember once attending. Um, attending a protest in Denver while shielding the people from their oppressors. This was during the George Floyd protest organized by the Black Lives Matter movement. Oh yeah, that was huge. We were we were amazed, yet we had no yet we had to be sure everyone got out and made it home safely. My mentors would be of my mentors would be of my own people. I'll never forget when Al Rojas for guiding me in my in my first direct action and the boycotting this uh Driscoll's period. I'll never forget our conversation over the phone with him explaining why it's important that we boycott Driscoll's. Driscoll's was held responsible for poor wages, cruelty to workers, hiring the 
the underage and sexual harassment towards women. That's fucking disgusting. Also, I, also, I think that name is Irish. It sounds Irish to me, at least. Another mentor would be Ralph Av- Avitia. It's either Avitia or Avicia. I think it's Avitia. He guided me into the movement. I then became a member of the of the Bray, and he continued to provide me feedback. My revolutionary heroes would be Che Guevara, fuck yeah, the Zapatistas, hell yeah, and all my comrades who who fight racism. Yes, there was a time when the odds were against me. Others tried to humiliate me through social media by bringing up my past. We all have history. I was not going to allow those attacks to bring me down. Some of us go through relationship issues. Unfortunately, I was in a bad situation. I began dating an individual during my separation from my ex. Husband. My boyfriend was an insecure and jealous person. Once he went to my house and shot my ex-husband multiple times. However, my ex-husband somehow survived. What the fuck? The individual who brought up my past somehow was convinced it would break me. It did not. I simply became resilient. Recently, another person placed my life in danger by telling people that I was some sort of agent. It was a horribly false accusation, which I only ignored while simply doing the work. I've been through hell and back. In September, I was brutally physically attacked. I had to fight for my life. The perpetrator tried to rape and kill me. I kept thinking that I was not going to give up my life. I have children. I can't go out like this. I can't die now. I suddenly felt our ancestors' presence and began fighting back for my life. I am present. About three years ago, I attended my first danza class by the river in Pueblo. Where I met, where I met Grupo. I forgot how to spell that word. Grupo. Choc, 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 chitil. Uh, Yesenia, you have the proper pronoun- pronunciation because I don't even know how to uh, to pronounce pronounce that. It's Grupo Sochi. That's Sochi. what I thought. Thank you. I- I knew the I knew the H, uh, not the H. I knew the X made a ch sound. Grupo Sochi, or a C sound rather. I met Grupo Sochi. This experience changed my life. It was my it was my calling because of the heart of the drum. Since I was a child, I had always admired the danza the danzantes. I knew I would be a danzan a danzante. I just didn't know when. I don't know what Dazante is, but it sounds pretty cool. I'll continue empowering our women and youth as there is much we must do for our people. Our women should understand that they are intelligent and know of their worth. Our youth are yearning to be heard and it's important that we listen to them. Right fucking on. Yeah. Is that it? And then uh, Comrade Gabby, a Dazante. Um, so I'm a Dazante as well. If you've ever gone to like a Cinco de Mayo festival or Dia de los Muertos, it's um, oh, yeah. the Mexica Aztec dancers that have the feathers and their trajes, their regalia. Ah, gotcha. the I've seen I've seen pictures of them, but unfortunately, I've never been to a Dia de los Muertos. Not because I don't want to, but because my parents are fucking say that uh, because, because my parents fucking think that's worshiping the fucking devil or some Christian yeah. bullshit like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. If you ever get the opportunity or YouTube or even check out my page because you could see me and Peggy dancing together. Ooh, um, hell yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. Um, but yeah, exactly right here. I really love what they're saying because the youth are their future. The youth the, it's the youth that are going to continue the revolution and we must and we have to meet them where they're at. Because the materialistic conditions and needs <laughs> of the youth are not going to be the same as those um, for the last generation or the last generation or the last generation okay. before that. Everything is always changing, evolving, <laughs> adapting. And the way that we engage in the struggle for liberation and self-determination now is not going to be the same as we did back then because our needs and our material conditions are going to be different. So how we apply our tactics and how we apply that scientific and principle analysis will be different through practice. So right on. We have to meet them where they're at and struggle alongside them. Yep. And I'm glad that's that, cool. I'm glad. I'm glad she mentioned about uh uh Meta, which is in case you don't know, it's uh the Chicano uh student movement of Asan. Um ah, it, I didn't know yeah, that. It, 
yeah, they've been around uh, for about 50, about over 50 years now. And um, if you go to like, you know, especially like the colleges in the LA area, there's a lot of uh, Mecha uh, clubs uh, in those uh, colleges like uh, California State University, Dominguez Hills. And um, uh, I think the University of California in Long Beach, um, there's a lot in Asan and um, they were in a lot of hot fire from reactionaries because, um, you know, of Asan thinking that, you know, it's a mythical place, New Fla News Flash is not. And they had to drop Chicano and Asan from their name back in 2019 because they thought it was homophobic and, you know, anti-Black and, you know, all that stuff, which is not because those terms are already you know, been around for a very, very, very long time. So it didn't make any sense. And, um, you know, there were uh, reports of, um, of of racism and, you know, colorism within uh, Mecha overall, um, you know, you know, and, you know, try to erase the indigenous identity of Chicanos because, I mean, literally look at the name Chicano. Like, come on, like, um, they were doing that. The reactionaries were doing that. And, um, you know, they did uh, ban Mecha movements, you know, you know, pr you know, promoting these, you know, these so-called lies of, you know, Asan being a real place and, you know, Chicano, you know, having homophobic, you know, anti-African origin and stuff like that, which is literally not the case because because the Black Panthers and the Brown Berets did a lot of work together. So I don't want to hear it. But that's essentially uh, that's essentially uh, the thing with Mecca. They're still around. They still have Asan and Chicano in their name. They still have Chicano and Asan in their name, and rightfully so because that is because that is what they are. Um, they are still around in the clubs. Uh, those clubs are still around, especially in the colleges in California, like in the LA area, like heading towards the so-called. Uh, Mexican side of Turtle Island. So they are still around and they still have Chicano and Asan in their name. So. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I wanted to, I wanted to share. I wanted uh, to share. Yeah. Mecha is um, quite alive in a lot of states, not just California. It's also in Arizona. Yeah. Or, or what we yeah. consider Aslan, Texas, Colorado. Mm -hmm. and so, and I believe there, there are even, there's some in other, other states also. Um, but yeah, we were actually had an event yeah. with the Umas and Mecha students um, a couple months back, and they came out from California. Excuse me, they came out from California and um, did a march throughout Boulder, Colorado, downtown Boulder, and everything, um, bringing awareness to those states of Boulder that were murdered and killed, car bombings. Um, they were activists. They were students and lawyers and leaders that were trying to push for change on the universities and they were killed. Um, and so we were able to actually be on campus and go to the different locations and um, look, see the tribute, the memorial that they did of the students um, and the building that they had taken over. So it was really empowering and really it was sad, um, just like, because you're remembering the murders, the, the massacres for people who are trying to fight for us to have equal rights, equitable rights, and not be exploited on campuses. Um, yeah. And just fighting for equality, just fighting for that, you get killed, you get, and then you get painted in as if you're a terrorist or whatever it is. Um, but it's it's just a rigged sad system and world that we live in um, but it was very empowering to be able to be there in person and hear the stories hear the history because i've never heard about it before right on also right on. also that guy also that guy in that picture on the left he looks badass as fuck <laughs> he looks yeah. really fucking cool yeah and also there is a mecha uh club at the university of illinois Right. Uh, yeah, 
I, I forgot, I forgot about that. I actually followed them. And one of my um, Oriqua uh, Chicano uh, besties is a part of it. And, um, you know, UIC has a very large Chicano native uh, student population. So um, they are active. They're having an event uh, later this week, later this week for uh, Ia de los Metros. And, you know, they're, once again, they're still here and popping. They still got Chicano and Aslan in their name. And, you know, they're, you know, uh, fighting the young, the cause of the of the young Chicanos um, on campus and, you know, in surrounding areas. So they're still very much here. So. Yeah, and I wanted to add also um, that depiction of that statue is Emiliano Zapata. Oh, that's a statue? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. So, oh, so that's that was, the, the depiction. I didn't, know that, I didn't know that was a statue. I thought, yeah. I thought that was an actual person. Familiar. <laughs> <laughs> he looked familiar. And, and what Yesenia was saying, I missed that. I missed that. Um, I went to the first day, the, the Mecha and uh, Umas and... Uh, there's another word. They had a national conference. So there was teachers from uh, ethnic Chicano studies that came from New York, Chicago, all, all, all the Southwest states. Uh, that was pretty that was pretty awesome to see. But I didn't have a ride to go the following day. So I oh. missed that. But I got to see pictures and uh, you all represent it well. And that is all. Cool. <laughs> right on. Right fucking on. All right. La... In Ohano, sorry, like in Oha, like in Ohana, in o, sorry, sorry, I, I need to practice my, my Spanish a little bit more. In Ohana, um, like in Ohana, right, 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 like in Ohana, chic, um, chicanita, um, pre, prieta, 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 yeah. Does anyone want to read this one? Oh, you, you can read it. It's okay. No, 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 it's okay. I, I, I already read. I don't want to read uh too many. Um, Yesenia or Shanti, do y'all, do y'all, do y'all want to read this one? Um, yeah, I can read it if you want me to take over. I mean, you can take over. Okay. Um, and then for this story, it was uh so on Thursday we actually me and Peggy went to the Rita J Martinez Youth Leadership Conference. That they have out in Pueblo and over it was like almost five I think it was like 500 kids I know it was over 400 kids that came from all over Colorado and um, they were able to go to different workshops um, learn about the history storytelling um, for our presentation we did the take it down of the Columbus statue and just the history behind it um, they also got to paint uh, and make little necklaces uh, with the empowerment vest. So we got to just discuss and educate them. And they learned, they taught us as well, um, you know, just like where they're from and who they are. And they express themselves to the art and everything. Um, it was It was a great event. And she was able to share this story in person. So it was amazing having her there. And um, having the book there as well. So shout out to Johnny for putting all of this together um, and just being able to show the representation that people like us can share our stories, that we can be published, that we can share our knowledge, share our experiences, and we can relate to one another. Um, and then if you guys want to see the event, I believe Peggy has it live on her Facebook. La God. enojona, thank you. La enojona prieta, Moody dark brown chicanita. Moody because of life trauma she endured growing up in the migrant life in Califas. She never knew if she was going to another school where she would sleep. Sometimes she slept in the car, vacant homes, strangers' homes that would offer her mom and brother shelter. We lived in so many towns. I remember attending approximately 26 schools, causing illiteracy in me due to a poor education. I had speech problems and having a lisp hindered my communication. I was always upset and also afraid for my safety. I was a child and could not understand why these predators would try to touch me. I hated myself. 
Angry soul, I spoke. La enojona chicanita prieta, moody because she knew they were moving again and again, attending new schools, making new friends, and unexpected leaving once more. I remember living in Arizona and San Luis, Mexico, and everywhere in California. Maybe that is why I love to drive and travel. La enojona chicanita prieta was always quiet but observant. I still am and always watching my surroundings. La enojona chicanita prieta telling myself, I'm going to be the import I am going to be important in life and I will be there with the people. And I just know I'm going to do good things when I become an adult. I simply had no idea what I would do and become. I was never the resilient I was never this resilient and strong. I grew up with lots of trauma and made mistakes. I remember back in 99 in North Carolina, the day a beautiful and intelligent black woman who became my good became my good friend, told me, go to school and stop being submissive. You are strong and you have so much potential. I'll never forget her and those words that sparked a fire in me. I agreed, yes, I am headstrong. I divorced and that is chingon. Muri Chicanita Prieta witnessed something powerful one day, which was forever imprinted in her spirit. I haven't shared this with anyone until now. I was a little girl of seven in, in 1979. It was a hot summer in the Campesino in Calipatria inside of the house in which we lived. The TV was on and I saw these people who looked like some type of superheroes. One woman looked powerful and I watched as they raised their fists and spoke to others on the PBS program. I was curious and wished to know more about them. It was the first time seeing the original Black Panthers. They have always been important to me. How could I have known that one day I would stand in solidarity with Black Panthers and work together for the people? They are my familia and no one will ever change my respect for them. Muri Chicanita Prieta is Wieselin Chamali, the Chamali of the people Hummingbird Shield. This was the unfortunate beginning of an angry colonized child because she was aware that things weren't right, not knowing that the traumas could have hindered her from becoming a Chicano a Chicana revolutionary nationalist. Viva la causa, all power to the people. Peggy Aida Ramirez. All power to the fucking people. All power to the people. All power. That was beautiful. Robert Garcia. Shanti, you want to read this one? Yeah, I can. Right on. All right. Bio, Robert Garcia. Robert Garcia is a Chicano activist in the state of Illinois, my state. Originally from Texas, or Tejaslan, he is a border child who grew up swimming in El Rio Grande. Today, he focuses on immigrants' rights activism and community organizing. Robert is on the board of the Urban 100. He is also a founding member of the Bloomington Normal Afro-Socialist and Socialist of Color organizations. He is a national trainer for the Democratic Socialists of America. Robert is an asylum seeker sponsored through ASSP or the Asylum Seeker Sponsorship Project, where he successfully pulled several asylum seekers out of ICE detention centers. He's a sponsor through the Afghan Welcome Home Project, where he's currently leading efforts to sponsor and settle several Afghan refugee families in central Illinois. And he is on the National Executive Committee of AfroSoc. In central Illinois, Robert also serves as a trained community navigator for the undocumented community and as a certified Know Your Rights trainer for immigrants both through TIP, the Immigration Project, Robert Garcia. That's him. I realized I was brown. I was a kid in elementary school in a small town in Texas. One day, my teacher looked at me with surprise and exclaimed before the entire class, Wow, Roberto, 
You speak English better than I thought you would. Your English is really good. I was shocked. I was in shock. So confused. Like, what? Why? It was the first time in my life that I realized I was brown. That was how they saw me. I did not see myself that way until then. And it stuck. No soy mexicano. There's a reason they call us Mexicans here. You see, before the USA, before, Mexi before Mexico existed, all the land belonged to our ancestors, our indigenous ancestors. By labeling us Mexican, they make us foreigners in our own land. Exactly fucking right. Our people have always been here. Our tribes roamed the continents, traded with each other, and reforged with nature until they arrived. You see, they refused to teach Native American history in schools. If they did, everyone would know that most Mexicans are Native Americans. We are mainly indigenous. Can you imagine if they were to tell the truth? They would change the entire na narrative. It would destroy their propaganda. How would it appear if they were locking up Native Americans in concentration camps instead? They don't want you to know that those people crossing the border are crossing an imaginary line into their own land. The colonizers want you to believe these are foreigners invading their country. That is, what, that is why they refuse to teach the truth. This destroys their narrative, the lie upon which all their evil is based. Decolonization begins with telling truth. Right fucking on. What radicalized you? For me, it is seeing people who look like me walked up in cages right here in my own country. And then looking around at my fellow Americans and seeing them act as if this is normal. I had to decide, do I normalize this? Do I go along with this to stay sane and normal? I, however, couldn't do it. It changed me. It radicalized me. It birthed the activist in me. I accepted that my anger was justified and I didn't want to be normal if it meant being like them, like those around me who saw this evil and just go on about their day ignoring reality. I decided to embrace my anger to raise my fist, to uplift those whose voices that are silent, those voices that are silenced in cages. I hope I never become like them. I wish to, I never wish to normalize this evil. Racism is confusing, then numbing. Many years ago, there was a time when yelling at when yelling at me to go back to Mexico would really upset me. Now it's crazy how I've gotten so used to it Think that I think it's funny. Before Trump, people denied that it was even happening. My conservative friends would claim I was making it up. Even when I told people, hey, this jerk told me I should go back to Mexico. And, I, and I'm really bothered by it. Today, I hear it so often that it's no longer worth talking about. For some reason, it used to matter to me. It used to hurt me. Now it's meaningless and actually funny. Is it weird that it's become so commonplace it no longer bothers me? I'm confused at today's racism. When it was subtle, it felt more personal and it really hurt me deeply. Today, it is completely meaningless to me. Or is it me, possibly? Maybe I've changed and I just don't care anymore. I have forgotten how it used to bother me long ago. I've become numb to it now. Robert Garcia. Everything there was the objective fucking truth. That's the truth. And the truth is Chicanos are native. Chicanos are indigenous to this land. They already were here. Go into um, so-called little village or Pilsen here in Chicago. Do you see a Spaniard face? Do you see a European face? No, you don't. You see native people. Native people. Once again, they are native to this land. To be illegal? on your own land? That's the exact same thing that's going on in Palestine with uh, indigenous Palestinians not, not able to have uh, control their own destiny on their own land. These are all interlinked. And I wanna make it very, very clear once again that I'm glad that he brought up the fact that y'all are indigenous to this land, mm -hmm. to this continent. This is your home. 
This is their home. They have been here for a very, very long time from the very beginning. They always been here until the Spaniards came, until the Italians came and tried to exterminate every single one of them through disease, through genocide, but they're still here. But many of them don't think that they're native because of mestizaje, because of Latinidad, because of machoism, because of these things introduced by Spaniards that they think that they are born to their own land, to this land, to Stamanahuac, to Aslan, and thinking that, you know, Aslan is just some, it's just another mystical place. It's not. It's not. I'm right here. I literally had somebody try to fucking argue with me about that the other day, and I was like, do you not realize the only fucking difference between who you do you know as a Native American versus a Mexican is whether they got raped by the English and French or by the Spanish and Portuguese. Get yeah, the fuck okay. out of here. Like, They're get the fuck out of here. These are all indigenous people. The and only difference, the only fucking difference is who colonized them. That's it. That's yep. it. They're so indigenous. They're, they're so they're here. So... Decolonization needs to happen all across all the across fucking the... quote unquote Americas, both both in the Anglo sphere and the land sphere, all across. All across, because once again, Chicanos are not so called Mexican American. That is an assimilationist identity that was mm-hmm. created to to destroy the Chicano movement, to strip Chicanos of their indigenous identity and embrace being. Uh, having heritage from both cellar states. They're not from cellar states. They are from this land. They're from Samanahuac and Aslan. They are from so-called Mesoamerica. They have been here. They have been here. The Yucatan Peninsula, um, so-called El Salvador, so-called Honduras. That was Maya land and other groups that have mingled with each other. They've been here. The main difference is who colonized them, who raped them, who tried to exterminate every single one of them. But there's still tens of millions of indigenous people, even those who are, you know, not uh, culturally connected with their bloodline. It doesn't change the fact that they're native. It doesn't change the fact that they're native. Your blood doesn't lie. Blood does not lie. The roots don't lie. The roots don't lie. And the fact of the matter is these people trying to, you know, separate the so-called Mexican from the so-called native even though there was no USA at all until the English came to a particular spot of um, of Turtle Island. So, you know, the Chicano movement is a native movement. It has been a native movement. And um, just like I talked about uh, Mecha, about how the so-called Mexican-American reactionaries tried to destroy Mecha by saying that Chicano and Aslan are you know, uh, homophobic terms, that they are uh, uh, so-called anti-Black terms, that they are misogynistic terms, which they are not. They are not. Once again, trying to keep Chicano children away from who they truly are. Because if they knew who they truly were, then the whole Latinidad complex would sink completely. They're native. And it makes it very, very clear. Like, once again, go into a Chicano barrio. You see European face? No, you don't. No, you don't. You can tell that they are not Spaniard. Even though they have Spaniard in them, it doesn't make them Spaniard. They're still native. They're still Nahua. They're still Mexica. They're still Mixtec. They're still Maya. You know, they're still Zapotec. You know, they're still Apache, uh, Yaki. You know, they're still those people. Still being they never left. <laughs> I never left. I, I, I see okay. Trisha has her hand up. I'll yeah, I was going to. Uh, I was going to see that. Sister Zen, you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I wanted to point out that the parallel that you drew between what's happening here and what's happening right now in Palestine is extremely fucking valid. And this is another point where I've had to stop people and fucking correct them. Um, I, I've had some comrades forwarding stuff to me from people making pro-Israeli arguments and asking me, you know, like, what what can they counter those with? Um, and it starts with, you know, the, the Zionism being 
anti-Semitic in and of itself. Because the same type of erasure that's happened here of deeming people Mexican-American instead of acknowledging their indigenous roots is the same fucking thing that's happening right now to Palestinian people. Um, This erasure of the fact that Palestinians and Jews are both Semitic, okay? The it, Zionism itself is anti-Semitic when it is trying to do ethnic cleansing to Palestinian people who are Semitic. But because of this distinguishing bullshit when it comes to words and word play being used for manipulation, um, people don't realize that Arabic and Jewish people are of the same ethnic group of being Semitic. So when when one uh, when when we have settlers who are at this point mostly of European descent and are adhering to and not all of them. Okay, sadly we have to put that fucking you know clause out there of not all Ashkenazi, but Zionists who are Ashkenazi playing white supremacist shit of trying to erase the fact that Palestinian people are indigenous Semitic people of the Arabian Peninsula. We have a fucking problem, and especially considering like one of the things that was sent my way was this reference of like oh well this has been the land of israel since it was judea well if if that's what you want to go by is what is in the torah then you should read the part where it says that the you know hebrews came in and fought against the canaanites and the philistines and we all know from like roots of languages okay philistine is basically got what or what got translated to palestine um so literally the Torah itself acknowledges that Hebrews stole the land in the first place. Like, are are they, are we indigenous to the region? Yes. Specifically to the land that was dubbed Judea then in Israel now? No. No. It was a land seizure then too. That's all. Exactly. The, the Palestinians are literally the descendants of the Canaanites. That's what they are. They're literally the descendants of the Canaanites. That's it. That's I see it. Uh, Comrade okay. Yessi has her hand up also. Can we give her right a share some space? Of Please. course. Com- Comrade Yessi, you got, you got the mic. Thank you. Um, I really like this piece because I could relate to it a lot, especially growing up here in Colorado. It was really divided between um, white kids and brown kids. Uh, now there's more diversity since we have more um, refugees. But it, growing up here, it was in the 90s was a little bit different. And I would always hear, go back to Mexico or wet back, um, border crossers, you know, or illegal aliens, whatever, all this stuff. Um, but for people who, and I, I can't speak on behalf of like second, third, fourth, fifth generation, like Chicanos, what you would consider Chicanos for what we're labeled as. But um, for my parents being migrants here, we were always told, you know, this was Mexico. All of this was Mexico before and the U.S. stole it. Um, And we had to learn that knowledge. We had to learn that history. And it always contradicted what our teachers taught us. Um, And so it was always interesting trying to piece together the pieces and figure out the truth because they're like oh well the teacher should know this is the school right and then at home it's a whole another story and it's just early on brainwashing and erasure and there's a poem i can't remember i can't remember all the lines or the the who the author is but it talks about say you're mexican say you're Mexican American don't say you're indigenous don't say you're native um keep your ceremonies your dances hidden um don't share it with anybody because we would be killed we would be killed for uh practicing our traditional ceremonies or that dances or prayers yeah um 
speaking our language um, and then trying to be converted to Christianity or Catholicism and speaking Spanish. And then once uh, the United States formed, speaking English. So it's just constant waves of colonization. And we can't ever say we live in a post-colonial area because we're still in it. <laughs> so right. it's still happening and never left yeah, it's, so United- it's, it's just like saying oh yeah we're post covid no no it's, still here. it's not gonna go away no i mean um, well here you got people vomiting on the sidewalk it's not over it's not over it never ended hell hell in florida right now there is literally a new variant of COVID that's fucking out now, but, but, but you really see, but you, but you barely see these news fucking, uh, these news channels talking about it because it's no longer profitable to talk about it. Because they want to brainwash, because they want to brainwash us. Exactly. They want to make it seem like, <laughs> like, they want to make it seem like, like it went away. Like we live in a, in a magical u- utopia. Like, no, <laughs> no, it's fucking, it's horrible here. Also, Comrade Joe, I see you have your uh, hand up. Uh, Yes, um, I wanted to read something that was sent to me this morning. Uh, A few days back, um, this uh, Chicano indigenous elder uh, Uh reached out to me and and he's been sharing knowledge with me, kind of like a mentor. And if you guys don't mind, it probably will take like two minutes if uh, if I could read this. Of course, go ahead. I think it, it goes relative of what's going on. And I guess he's a poet also. So his name is Steven Esquivel. Mm-hmm. And this is what he sent me this morning. I wrote this in 2003 as a response to all the people that say and want the past in the past. I entitled it colonization. It has been said it is much too long ago and it is way too late to bring the sins of the past into the light. But if that be so, no, no, that does not make it right. No, that does not make Not even everything forgiven and resolved to date. Though past atrocities for some on humanity uh, humanity may be in the past, which is easy to say for those that are free at last. But too many are living the effects of those wrongs. And too many of those have something other than white skins. Perhaps that is hard for some to hear. Perhaps that is hard for some to bear. But what are those still hearing the cries, still seeing those they love needlessly die from the consequences of the past, for the reality for them, which still last. Perhaps these historical wrongs of colonization, slavery, religious indoctrination, persecution, cultural genocide, rape, murder, torture, global theft, pillage, and plunder should be taken to the world court against those nations and entities still alive and thriving. True historical crimes against humanity brought forth that historical truth, accountability, and consequences can be realized, accepted and seen by all in the world. That a true healing of the world's peoples can begin arriving through this judicial ruling of consequences and responsibilities for these past wrongs that these nations and entities be made to do everything possible to make those who were wrong whole again, as in and as was known in their history of life to them, sign Hummingbird. That's, I, I kind of thought it related to a little bit of what we were reading today. Um, right on. Yeah. Was, I, was, I, just, I just thought that was so inspirational. I wanted to share it with you, comrades. It's inspirational. It's beautiful. And these oppressions, I've said before, I'll say again, these oppressions are still happening to this very fucking day. They, they've just taken new forms. They've just become more sophisticated in, hide, in hiding it, but they're still happening today. Instead of full on child slavery, you have the prison complex. Instead of, instead, instead of full on segregation, you have redlining now. Instead of a white mob going to a new African community and burning it down. And, and replacing it now you have justification these oppressions st- still exist they they're still here they've just taken new forms they've just gotten more sophisticated and hiding it same similarly to imperialism before we had colonialism now we have neocolonialism they just gotten better at hiding it to make it seem like it's all gone to make it seem like um like we, like we no longer face these oppressions but it's still here 
So it's very it's day. Still, exactly the illu- the illusion of progress, the illusion of freedom, the illusion that we have a choice, the illusion that yeah. we've that that we've quote unquote moved on. We haven't fucking moved on. We're still we're, we're worse off than we were back then. Nothing yeah. has changed. Nothing has Nothing. changed. It's it's changed for the worse. We're still experiencing oppression to this very fucking day. Fascism is still growing in the United States, especially in Florida with Ron Bitch DeSantis over here. <laughs> it, it's but still growing. It's still it's growing. Still ha- it's still here. It's still happening. And, you know, like even with the so called independence movements uh, back home in my indigenous homeland of Africa, you know, it, you know, it's like we, how, how do we uh, achieve independence when our ancestral, then, because how do we gain, how do we achieve independence when new Africa's ancestral peoples, the Congo people are still being exploited and genocided for cobalt, for the iPhones? How do we achieve independence yet we have legislative genocide against uh, queer and trans people? against any kind of queerness, of transness, of gender and sexual fluidity on our homeland, in, Uganda, in so-called Uganda, in so-called Nigeria? How do we achieve independence when South Africa is still here? Uh, if, I, if I can uh, interject on that, if you don't mind, uh... Yeah. One of the, one of the things that he had mentioned, and it was kind of mentioned in the book earlier too by a couple of the of the the writers and of uh, the poems that we read today, um, how you know brown berets have worked hand in hand with the uh, Black Panthers, and I think the other one was Afro Afro sock. Afro sock. Uh, I follow them too. Oh, okay, but it, and it goes it goes to show that um, you know, and and this is what this is what I wanted to share with, with this. Uh, this elder brother had told me the other day, he says, Joe, the only way we're going to get it done is if we bring all the ethnic communities uh, working together, such as what we're doing here in the Rainbow Coalition. And I think it's really powerful. And he says, that's going to be the deciding point of actually getting shit done or just talking about getting shit done. And that's I what, just, I, I just wanted way. to share. That's the all way. That, that's what we got to do. We got to turn it. We got, we got, we have to turn areas of division into our opposites, into, into our opposite. area, into areas of unity. That's that's what the whole united, that's what the whole second rainbow coalition is for. It's a united front, turning areas of oppression during turning areas of division into unity by having, um, by having, um, by including different organizations re- rep- representing different, different point. oppressed. Different, different parts of the proletariat, different nationalities, different ethnic groups, and so on and so forth in order to build yeah. that unity. It, it's going to take all of us. All of yeah. us. Because once again, racial feeling is not liberation. It's not. Racial feeling not. is not liberation. It cannot be a race struggle. It cannot be, you know, just, you know, it cannot be race war. It cannot be gender war. It cannot be ability war. It cannot be fat versus not fat. No, it's a because class all, struggle. God damn it! It's a class struggle, and we need to talk together, together, because we cannot be, you know, isolated from everyone else and thinking that you know we're making strides. No, we have to talk together. The uh, the cis folks need to talk with the trans folks together. The Africans need to talk with the Chicanos, with other oppressed people together and vice versa, because the only way we can get out of it is with class solidarity within each facet of the lumpen, which each facet of the proletariat and really get our ideological line purely period, purely socialist, purely scientific, purely dialectical, purely revolutionary so that we don't fall under the traps of the bourgeois ideology and the bourgeois culture that reductionism that we have been subjected to, especially since the Konto Pro days. We're not going back there. We need to talk now together. Together. Right on. 
right fucking on. We need to combat all the contradictions of capitalism. We need to combat racism, misogyny, ableism, queerphobia, all of it. Not some of them, not most of them, all of them. And the only way we're actually going to fight them is by learning and struggling alongside those who are oppressed by those contradictions. We cannot ignore the primary and the secondary. They're interconnected. They're one and the same. They both ha- they both interconnect and, and have a piece in one another. The secondary derives from, from the primary, but the primary can be found within the secondary. The secondary contradictions are like the um, are like the shadow of the state. They're the shadow of the oppressor, and the root of it is capitalism. If we ignore the shadow of it, then we can't penetrate um, the actual base. And if we and if we and if we just focus on the base without the shadow, then we'll never be able to fully get rid of it. We have to combat yeah. all of it. Also, Sister Zen, I, I saw that you had your hand up. Yeah, you and uh, Johnny too. Sorry. Yep. And Johnny Torres too. Oh, I mean, you put it in different words than I was going to, but basically, yeah, playing these games of, of racism, of people fucking thinking that it's white versus black versus brown versus anybody, that is playing right into what the fucking bourgeoisie want. Okay, that's why they planted those seeds. That's yep. why they planted them. Because the only way to fucking divide and conquer is to start with the dividing part. Mm-hmm. And dividing people who are coming together on a class basis because of all being oppressed financially and sociologically. And they were like, well, fuck, we got to find a way to break these people apart from each other. And they introduced fucking racism because... Otherwise, everybody would have already done United a long fucking time ago at the time of the founding of the fucking colonies and overthrown the bourgeoisie fucks who were starting to do the same shit to the people as what the monarchy had done that, you know, was abusing everybody back in fucking Europe. That's all. That's it. Yep, exactly. Um, Comrade Johnny? You know what I had to say? And after John, and after Comrade Johnny, I wanted to I wanted to read something that I had written um, that goes into this further. But anyways, go ahead, Comrade Johnny. No, uh, I was just uh, going back on uh, um, the 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 piece we just read not too long ago. All right. And then um, because he. Uh, Oh, it was Robert. Yes. Okay. So um, he's uh, an interesting uh, person, activist. Uh, I've never got to meet him just on, you know, social media. I guess he figured out uh, about the whole book. And he reached out to me and he told me his uh, his ideas and whatnot, which, you know, they were all interesting and everything. Uh, then um, he was the one, remember the, the story we read from the beginning from the, the Silent Seeker? The, I believe, Gabby, you read that one. And um, so that was the person that uh, Robert's uh, is the sponsor of that person that uh, the the silent seeker that we read of the story that was the person that was in ICE uh, detention center that was uh, was seeing all this stuff and uh, writing and uh, documenting and we were always we were all trying to figure out th- did this person ever get out were they still in there because they wrote as if they were still in there you know as if this this letter just saw the light of day yeah and uh, it it was a uh, a powerful piece when he what he put on because not just that he put something in for the book he decided to um get somebody else that he was sponsoring in the in the book as well because he felt that their voice needed to be heard because like i said the the book was in oh so many different levels of people involved in a movement or, or you know were in something or just getting out of a situation that was you know terrible and you know they documented in in their own way. So um, he he does talk about you know a lot of his roots, particularly how he was there, how he witnessed this as a kid, and now he's out of it, and now he's working to make things better. Uh, not not just you know doing whatever he has to do as a job, but he's definitely doing his spare time helping uh, silent seekers find a way out and uh 
helping them find a place, helping them find, you know, pretty much salvation. So that was good. So I feel like his story was, you know, very important because it, it actually shows uh, a person in uh, in these situations, but it shows them getting out and helping others get out as well. So that's why I feel like his story was important. And the person that he got in, that silent seeker who wrote that um, powerful poem about ICE and the way they treated her. Oh, yeah. And, oh, uh, yeah. That trans Chicana comrade. I remember yes. that. Yes, exactly. Very powerful. Yes. So that was, uh, you know, he was sponsoring uh, her and he got her out of that situation. So I was glad. And definitely, I, I always wonder, like, was there other people did he get out besides this person, you know, which I'm pretty sure he did. But uh, yeah, but uh, I guess that's what I want to, to cover, though. Right on. Right fucking on. Uh, comrade, sorry, Comrade Joe, you want to say something? Uh, yes, I, I believe uh, Comrade Zen mentioned that uh, we're we'll already be reaching an hour and a half. Uh, maybe if it's okay with everybody, we can end the recording and continue our conversation. We can hear what you had to read, uh, Comrade. Uh, and um, also, I wanted to share something else an elder had said, but so that we can make it... Uh, respectful to the, our, our YouTube listeners and and not lose their attention by dragging on more than the hour and a half. If right that's on. okay with everyone. Um, I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to, I just wanted to read something that I had written that, that correlates into, and that, that correlates into what we were talking before. Um, if that's okay. okay with everyone. Yeah. Yeah. That, be sounds too long. that sounds perfect. And then maybe after that we can of end course. the recording and continue our discussion. Of course. Thank you. So here's what I've written. Class struggle was then, is now. This isn't a white versus non-white fight, a queer versus cis hat, a man versus women, a neurotypical slash abled body versus a neurodivergent slash physically impaired struggle. This is a class struggle. All of these contradictions and oppressions are linked and interconnected. The secondary contradictions of capitalism, i.e. racism, misogyny, ableism, queerphobia, fatphobia, and all other oppressions and contradictions are rooted within the primary contradiction. The contradiction between the bourgeois and the proletariat. First came the idea of profit, then came the idea of, ra of racism, white supremacy, and the racial hierarchy. Racism is upheld to quote-unquote justify the exploitation, oppression, and subjugation of colonized people the siphoning of their resources, and pins colonize and colonizer against each other. Ableism is upheld because if you can't keep up with the production and labor compared to a neurotypical slash abled body person, you're discarded because it's easier to hire someone else and more profitable and pins, and pins, um, and pins able, um, abled body people and, neuro, and neurotypical people against, against neurodivergent and physically impaired people. Sexism and the misogynistic patriarchal system is upheld to make women nothing more than baby-making machines and pitting men against women, even if they have the same job and are being paid the exact same wage. Queerphobia is upheld. Queerphobia is upheld to uphold the family unit and continue the maximization of profit and to pin cis hat and queer people against each other. All of this ties to class struggle. Because the bourgeois can make a white person feel quote unquote superior to a non white person, they align more with the bourgeois. If they can make a cishet person feel quote unquote superior to a queer person, they align more with the bourgeois. If they can make a if they can make a man feel quote unquote superior to a woman, they align themselves with the bourgeois. If they can make a neurotypical slash abled body person feel quote unquote superior than a neurodivergent slash physically impaired person, they align with the bourgeois. All of these oppressions are linked to the primary contradiction of capitalism. All of these contradictions must be combated through a cultural revolution, a mass line, survival programs, educating and elevating the masses to struggle alongside them, uh, understanding their materialistic conditions and materialistic needs and where they are psychologically as well, applying a scientific and class analysis on each community and implementing that dialectical and organizational structures and adapt our um, our analysis to each and every to each and every community and their materialistic conditions and needs. 
to apply Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, and intercommunalism to each one of them. And once they see how these organizational structures actually work and actually and, and actually protect them, um, and once they see um, and once they see the Vanguard Party is giving a fuck about them and how it's providing for them and how it's and how it's their party, once they see us struggling alongside them, they will come to respect the party and the revolutionary activities, and then they'll take part and accept the ideological and political line of the party through observation and participation. Then they will see things through a scientific and class analysis. Then they will have a dialectical and historical analysis on our society and why things are the way they are. And it all comes by struggling alongside them. And yeah, that's what I wrote. It's all power to the people. Very, very nice. Thank you for sharing that with us all. I thought it was very powerful. Right on. Um, but, uh, if that is it, um, does anyone else have anything to add? Comrade Shanti, Zen, uh, Yesenia, Johnny? Um, I can think of, I was just wanted to say that, I just wanted to say that it tends to be because of the system and how it's structured and how we are living today in our society. We're very, we're made to believe that we have to be very individualistic, that our families have to come first, um, that our loyalty and our bond is to our kin, um, our parents, things like that. And that's understandable, but it's gotten to the point where it's at the expense of other families. Um, mm -hmm. as you're like, so we're given the scraps and I'm not going to lose my better half of the scrap or my little bit of the inside of the bread, um, just to give you some, because then they're going to take it away from me. And then both of us don't have anything. And that's what that's it is. Mm -hmm. Individualizes, individualizes the whole, the whole of humanity. Because once again, um, it takes a village to raise a child and what capitalism has done is that it's divided all of us by making by making um the only way to survive under a capitalist society is to give up our labor so instead of working intercommunally with one another and providing for the benefit of the whole we're alienated from our labor we're alienated from the means of production and we're alienated from each other because under a capitalist society it's either um, it's um, it's everyone out for themselves, and it encourages the individualistic behavior to do whatever it takes to bet to to, be to benefit you and your kin um, by any means necessary to backstab everyone around you and step on others as long as it means they 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 get a bigger chunk of the bread. That's what that's the behavior that it encourages. It encourages that that behavior oh because my God, not... so... sorry. Sorry, what? My dog. Never mind. I didn't realize it wasn't muted. Yeah. <laughs> I hope your dog is your dog okay, Sister Sun. <laughs> I'm just getting trampled. Oh man. So but yeah. don't mind me for yeah. like, trying to tell him to quit fucking climbing on me. <laughs> it hurts. Right on. But yeah, that's what capitalism does. And it's only through intercommunalism and survival programs and actually struggling alongside other communities and providing for them and showing them that we don't need our oppressors that we will be able to encourage um collective behavior instead of individualistic behavior because human beings are an intercommunal species that's how we survive that's how we that's how we evolved and that's how we've thrived and survived for the majority of human history and uh yeah um, but with that, does anyone else have anything to say? And I see they got your hand up, uh, Comrade Joe. Uh, yeah. Um, so we, we will be keeping it in time, but this just should only take thirty seconds. This is something else that an elder brother, um, sent, uh, aim elder brother, sent me today. Right on. And, uh, but here it goes. His name is David Hill, and and he was with uh, Leonard uh, Peltier back in the Leonard Peltier days. Uh, 
Oh, yeah. Dennis Banks, Russell Means, and, and many more. He says, in response to a young relative's inquiry, veteran, how do you join AIM and where can I get a patch? American Indian Movement. AIM, uniform of the past and today. Eat right, work out, no alcohol, no drugs, study our culture, learn our history, practice the arts of a warrior, and speak up for the people, and stand up to the oppression, and encourage others to do so the same. Teach when you can. Learn the skills needed to sustain yourself, and take care of your family and help others. Most importantly, take responsibility to cause change for the better. You don't join AIM, you be Come aim by beginning the journey that never ends being the best you can and helping others to do the same remember no matter how good you are or how much you bleed in a battle or how successful you are against the enemy there will be people who will tell lies about you and betray you it goes with the calling be a man all the time not just when it's convenient make the creator your main source of strength, all my relations. I just wanted to share it because I know we have uh, here in the Rainbow Coalition, we uh, have also AIM and I, we don't hear about them too much other than the Ojibwe Warrior book we read, but I just wanted to share that in also real quick. And with that, I have nothing else that I want to add. <laughs> right on. That was beautiful. Looking A. Well, to keep it short for our viewers, um, I will be ending the recording here. I think I can do that unless unless that's only something you can do, Sister Zen. Um, you can. I, gotcha. I can do that. So with that being said, all power to the people. Thank you, power everyone, for people. coming. Thank you, everyone who might be viewing this. And all love and power. All power. All, all power. power.